shalom, my friends. Shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And oh boy, am I delighted to have a journalist and what I would call an authoress in the neighborhood today. This is a woman who has written all about rock and roll and rock journalism, which is music that I used to listen to in the 1940s. But oh my God, check out what she's also written. Her book, her memoir, Mama Rama, a memoir of sex, kids, and rock and roll. She is also the associate professor at Loyola Marymount College, which is, oh, 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 oh. she's written for the Village Voice and for the Miami Herald, for gosh sakes. And she currently has a brand new book out, The World According to Joan Didion, which is all about Joan Didion, plus herself. She kind of injects herself in that new journalism way, which we're going to talk about now. But won't you please welcome to the neighborhood, Evelyn McDonald. Shalom, Evelyn. Thank you. Shalom, shalom. Thank you so much for having me here. One wee correction. Uh, I'm actually a professor, full professor now. Oh, you made so. full. I did. Yeah, a few years ago. So, so even yeah. before the new book, you made full. What, what did you have yes. a journal article published? What, what got you full there? Um, I think actually mostly the books that, uh, the, you know, I've just had, a, uh, since I've been at LMU with three, I've now had three books, but, but this before this book. So, but, um, Queens of Noise, the, uh, History of the Runaways and Women Who Rock and yes, many other articles and academic and non. So let me ask you what, um, everybody grew up loving rock and roll of, of your generation and, and several generations after mine, but what made you feel like you had something to contribute about the journalistic aspect and the reviewing aspect of rock? Right. Well, I have loved rock and roll along with Joan Didion and the rabbi here uh, since I was a teenager as well. Um, and I've been writing about it since I was a, a teenager. <laughs> um, but you chose that uh, as something to write about as opposed to all the other things in the world to write about. Why? Why rock? Um, because I really just loved it. I mean, it was, you know, I have to say, um, you know, Patty Smith as a teenager discovering her and her, you know, Patty as being someone who isn't just, is it, I shouldn't say just, uh, but does music, um, but is also a, a poet and was also a journalist, right? She wrote reviews for Cream Magazine back in the 1970s. So she was really an inspiration and a role model. Um, you know, I think, I, you know, I love music so much, but I was, you know, not good at making it myself, but I wanted to, it, it, it spoke so much to me, um, that I, I wanted to be part of it. And so I decided to write about it. Um, and remember the first review that you ever wrote and published about of an album or a song or something. Wow. I mean, cause I really started in high school. I wrote reviews for the high school newspaper and became the editor of the high school newspaper and, you know, wrote about, you know, bands that came to town or were from my small town in Beloit, Wisconsin. Um, uh, I can remember reviewing a Led Zeppelin album. Um, and that was the first time I was not crazy about an album that I had to review, although I liked the band very much. Uh, so having to figure out how do you write a review that's not um, in just uh, entirely positive. Um, was that Presence or which one? Do you remember which? Uh, it was In Through the Outdoor. Oh, yeah. Well, the last one, the, the, the one yeah. that they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's like Caris Alhambra is just too much of uh, any goddamn thing, uh, quite honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I said this as a rabbi. But but all right. So so then what made you make that leap? Because a lot of us, including the, the host of this program, we edited newspapers back in the day and wrote reviews and things like that. What made you make the leap into an actual professional journalist? Uh, okay, so in addition to loving music, I also loved writing and I loved reading. Um, avid, avid book reader, um, and you know, magazine reader. Uh, so I literally was in college. I was studying music. I was doing studying American studies, but it was focused on you know the birth of rock and roll really in the nineteen fifties. Um, and I also was writing for 
with school papers. And actually I was writing for a local alternative weekly in the town, uh, the new paper in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and it was kind of just a simple equation, you know, one, I love to write, two, I love music. Why don't I write about music, right? It was a career path. I mean, I, I will say that I, I never thought that I, you know, I never thought of myself as only someone who wrote about music. Um, I always tried to write about other things <laughs> um, and, you know, did and and have. But, you know, music was the continuing thread and, you know, was the majority of what I was writing. Well, let me um, ask you, oh, you, you mentioned yeah. that yeah, you love writing. I mean, we love reading, writing. And, but you know what? Teenagers love writing. For people who become writers, it's 95% pain in the goddamn ass and then, you know, 1% inspiration and joy and 4% like, you know, holding the gun, wondering if you're going to put the bullet in the head. How do you love it, though? I, you know, one of the reasons that I wrote, you know, fast forwarding a little bit to most recent project, wrote about Joan Didion. You know, she, she says what the essay, Why I Write, <laughs> um, named after a George Orwell essay also. One of the things that she she says is that she writes in order to understand the world, that it's a really important part of her process of of cognition and of intellectualism and of understanding is that she, it helps her articulate by by putting something on the page. She's not just articulate. It helps her understand in her mind. And I feel the same way, like it's much easier for me to explain what I feel or what I think if I write it down than if I'm trying to explain it to you now. <laughs> um, uh, fortunately, I've written some of these things down so then I can say them later, but it's really like integral, you know, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure painters feel the same way about painting and, you know, musicians feel the same way ab about making music. And, you know, Joan describes it very beautifully as um, that she has this image in her head and that her, her goal as a writer is to put it onto the page. I, I have, I understand that. I'm, I actually, for me, it's not even that, it's not as visual as that. Maybe it's more like audio because I, I guess that's the music part of me. Uh, but I feel like I, ha I have this noise in my head that I want to try to put into, into words and into, oh. and into rhythm, um, which I think- I have really a noise in my head, head that I put into one word, tinnitus. And it's horrible, but... I have that too. As a, oh, well, definitely rock, yeah, well, rock critters, rock critics, uh, yeah, <laughs> casualty of, yeah, now, absolutely. I too mentioned many... the journalism thing because when we read the uh, the Joan Didion book, The World According to Joan Didion, which by the way, you can get from Harper Collins on Amazon. So, um, <laughs> you well, back in the day when you read a biography of somebody, right. Uh, they just tell us that they were born here, they did this, there was this a high school friend, and it, and it goes that way. And if there was any connection between the subject and the author of the biography, it was in the introduction, it was in the preface. And it was like, oh, you know, I discovered so and so when I was in junior high school, I read the book, and it's carried me through all my life, and I used them, and then, and then you disappear as a narrator. And right. you, you just tell the story. The new journalism, or at least certainly for the Didion book, from what I've read so far, doesn't work like that. You're in it on a certain level from chapter one, um, not just interviewing as everybody does, but literally telling your story too. How do you feel right. about that as, as journalism and right. storytelling? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that the so-called new journalism, as it was called, albeit in the 1960s, so, you know, not necessarily new to 2023, although, um, you know, I think maybe to some people still new. Um, that was one of the explicit agenda of those writers, which, of course, included Joan Didion, as well as, you know, Gay Talese and Tom Wolfe and Hunter Thompson, et cetera, et cetera, um, was to get rid of that neutral, objective, um, sort of humanless voice of journalism. And to say that this journalism is being written or created by human beings. And we need to know who they are. I mean, part of this was um, being tired of their, the, the, you know, the TV network news dominated all the, the discourse of, you know, the, the hands of writing of journalism 
um, were in very few hands and, you know, they were, you know, now white male hands primarily. Um, and that was the idea of the neutral objective voice, right? And so the, the new journalist said, A, that's boring. B, it's it's inaccurate. Like, put your cards on the table. Tell us who you are um, and we'll decide whether we agree with you and are interested in your point of view. Um, because, you know, and not to say that journalism um, isn't trying to tell the truth and is not fact-based. And of course it is. But the journalist does choose which facts to present. And we want to understand where they're coming from. Um, and this is one of the things that Joan Didion really excelled at, right? And it was also very important that she did this as a as a woman, right? That she she you know was one of the few women in in that room. She was one of only two women in the classic new journalism anthology by put together by Tom Wolfe. Um, and to say, hey, you know, I'm here, and this is my point of view as as a woman that has not always been able to talk about these issues. And, you know, when she was, you know, precluded from talking about the Vietnam War, for example, by her editors at Life Magazine. Um, so, and, and here's what I think. And when she did that, you know, she did that very famously in her first column for Life Magazine in, I think, 1973. Um, you know, she said, I'm, you know, writing to you from a room at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in lieu of filing for a divorce. And I'm telling you this so that you know who I am and you can decide whether you want to read me. And, you know, for I've had women tell me that when they read that as it was published, that that was just like a dam breaking open, like, oh, my gosh, here's a woman talking about divorce and her marital problems. Um, and, you know, and, a, and by that time, she was a pretty known writer. Slav Schinter's Bethlehem had always come out, played as it lays and had come out. Um, and here she is speaking to these issues and things that were we're going through. So anyways, to bring it back to my book, I mean, so, you know, I will say my book is not by any means intended to be um, a typical biography or, or a complete biography or the authoritative biography. Um, it's a short book comparatively. Um, I do cover much of her her life in it, um, but I certainly cherry picked the things that I thought were, were really important. Um, and I, I really wrote it as more of like a series of of essays, of connected essays, and some of those some some of it is more personal than others. Um, I, I I just feel like that was an honest way to respond to Joan's writing because I feel like that's how so many of us respond to her writing. Well, let me. Add, by the way, we're talking with Evelyn McDonald, the author of The World According to Joan Didion, uh, which I'll is do a little. Book plug, even though it's backward because my mirroring's on, but there it is. <laughs> it doesn't come with all those cute, uh, colorful. No, this is this is my read. This is my that I read from uh, version. Oh, speaking of which, I, I want to give people a taste of of Evelyn McDonald as a writer here. This is an excerpt from very early in the book. Check out the writer. I, I love the end of this. But she, she's talking about um, California. Even before getting to John Dillian, of what California meant, because it was very important to her. And Sacramento, because people associate her with other parts of Cali, but she grew up early on in Sacramento. Sacramento is the eldest incorporated city in California, dating back to 1850, the same year California became a state. Before a Swiss con man named John Augustus Sutter convinced the Mexican government in 1839 to give him 48,000 acres of land at the junction of the Sacramento and American rivers, the area was populated by the Maidu, Patwin, Wintun, and Miwok, people who understood, I love this, the improvisation necessary to live in an area of ecological whimsy and who based their uh, diet on the smallest provenance acorns. The indigenous tribes did not try to cultivate or control the land because they obeyed the laws of the water and knew that nature had its own method of providing nutrition, tender protein encased in a hard shell, here it is, wearing a jaunty little cap. Oh my god, I, I just, I was like, well, how long did it take you to, was that instantaneous or to describe an acorn 
Because we, we see it, a jaunty little, like a yarmulke, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That would have been great, like a yarmulke. Anyway, um, a beret. Um, uh, wow, I don't remember exactly writing that sentence. Um, I don't know how many edits it went through. I, you know, I will say one of the things I really found out in studying Joan Didion's writing is the importance of of revision, um, and and going back through and choosing all those those words, um, uh, precisely, and you know, striking out and you know, did I have, uh, and, and could I have said something more precise than cap? Now I'm like, oh, maybe I should have said <laughs> no. Um, improvisation, the use of that word, now, right? I can tell that was you know either inspired by a, a moment of inspiration from you, or you struck out. Four different sounds ah. were landing on that one. Ooh, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. My dog is barking. Let me just let him out. And uh, I think my husband came home. One second. Oh. Okay. Hello, husband. Hello, dog. Hello. We're talking with Evelyn McDonald here in the sorry. neighborhood who just closed her I, door. Oh, he got you a coffee. I, I nice turned thing. my dog into a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Speaking of improvisation. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's fine. There's a Pugel Chino. So where were we? Oh, yes. But in terms of like... When you write, how many revisions? Because obviously there are people who say all writing is actually editing. Are you in that mode, the revision thing? Yes, I I think revision is is really really important. Um, and uh, again, something that you know I I knew, but I was really enforced by following Joan's writing and going and looking at her manuscripts and all the revisions that she went through. Yeah, I did. Um, her manuscripts, her manuscripts up until um, uh, what year? And through the through the seventies into the eighties too. I can't. Um, are they in a are, library somewhere? Or yeah, at the Bancroft Library at, at UC Berkeley. Um, the latter materials and everything else um, were acquired by the New York Public Library and aren't open to the public yet. And you know, until any of that, you know, until those materials are available, um, you know the full biographies can't really be written. So I sort of think of this as like a, a stopgap measure for all those who were discovering Joan Didion, so much attention paid to her when she died. Um, my book is uh, sort of um, something to dive a little bit deeper into her. And then hopefully when there's a longer biography by someone, um, people will take the next step. But anyways, um, yeah, I do, I do revise that, you know, this book was turned around quickly um so i might not have revised it and you know of course i read it now and i go oh i wish i had to change that word which is we all do that joan didion wrote about that that you couldn't even read her own writing later there are times um, i wish i had my foreskin back i'm telling you rare but uh, there are moments we all have those kinds of yes you, you see that yes <laughs> i want something else done uh, but, good one <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. So, so let me ask you, you teach journalism to college kids. And yes. I, there's so much to unpack with that because journalism in 2024 isn't even what it was in 2014. So first of all, what's the main thing you teach them? Um, what is the main thing that I teach them? It's, I, you know, I actually think that the, the first thing is critical thinking, right? You know, and, and our journalism department is housed in our College of, of Liberal Arts, um, partly for that reason. And, you know, really, you know, if you're going, and this applies to both, you know, there's always two parts to being a journalist. There's reporting, there's getting the story, there's getting the information. And you have to be thinking critically, even at that point, obviously, you have to be thinking about like, is what this person telling me a pack of lies? <laughs> or, um, or is it the truth, right? Because just because you you know, you interview someone doesn't mean that what they're saying is accurate. That's why we put it in quotes, right? Um, uh, so to, and, and to think critically about who you are choosing to interview, right? Who are the sources that you're using? Have you, are you just going to um, the public face of the story? Um, or are you representing all points of, of view? Um, are you going to the same hired sources <laughs> repeatedly, right? Like to, to really think about, um, you know, we, we, I, it's, I think it's in our mission at, at journalism that, you know, we think about who gets to tell stories about whom, right? And what is your position to the subject? And, um, 
both the interview subject as well as the story that you're writing about. Well, you mentioned early in the book when, when Joan Didion was covering the Haight-Ashbury scene, she could have done just like the spokespeople, the, the governor or whoever, but she just hung with family. She kind of immersed and, right. and as you say, she listened. That was right. her thing. She, she, she kind of just you know, let things happen around her and then just kind of, blah, blah, blah. and in doing so, you really tell the greater story sometimes, usually, I guess. Right, right. Like she liked to be that fly on the wall um, disappearing until, you know, and she, you know, she, she was famously shy and, you know, would let the, the silences fill the room um, or, you know, doing an interview until people just started talking. Right. And then that's, that's when she really got the story, um, particularly in Hate Ash ashbury right. Um, and that slouching towards Bethlehem, that famous, famous article. Um, so yeah, so I, I, listening is also a really important skill. I mean, a lot of, you know, writers, um, journalists have tremendous egos, <laughs> like so many artists, we kind of have to, to a degree. Um, but you have to put that ego aside and um, make sure that you're hearing what people are saying and, and you're letting them tell their story. You know, again, Joan just excelled at that maybe it took it too far um in interviews by you know some she she actually really she said that she didn't like to do interviews that she was very shy and it was it was hard for her um it doesn't seem that hard for you are you okay with interviews uh because i can be rather abrasive surprisingly uh but <laughs> um i i i like yeah, i like to do interviews i do actually i i'd like to talk to people um so when you are, I'm sorry to cut you off, but yeah, I am abrasive. But let me ask, do you feel that as an author who's becoming fairly well known on some levels, uh, that you now have to stand for something that you can't just be, you know, Evelyn McDonald, you wrote some books or journalist, you have 40 something, I guess, 30, 40 years in the field, but you also have to be Evelyn McDonald, representative, woman writer, feminist of whatever wave the wave is right now. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that that's interesting. And I have no problem with that. I've always identified myself as as a feminist. And that's been um, really important to me. And I've, you know, been an, an activist, too. And um, that's been important to me. You know, it's, it's interesting to note that Joan Didion was neither of those things explicitly. She never identified herself as as a feminist or an activist. And she really, you know, that's one of the criticisms people have of her is that um, she was very suspicious of social movements. Um, she was not, she was not a joint, not only was she not a joiner, uh, she was very, uh, sometimes contemptuous even of the women's movement, they famously in an article. Um, so, you know, those are, that's a place where I differ from her, but I can also see why she was reluctant because yes, you, you can put yourself in this position where now I have to stand for all feminism and support all women um, because I de have declared that as my point of view. I mean, you know, as, as you know, I, I also believe that there's feminisms, right? There's not just one feminist form of feminism. Um, and I also feel like we have to be able to critique each other. Um, I would say that the onus to appear respectable and think about what I say is thrust upon me more as a professor. And I'm also directing at LMU a new initiative that, I mean, this is brand new, hot off the press starting the semester called Media Arts and a Just Society, um, in which we're really trying to, it's an interdisciplinary initiative across the university where we're trying to bring together people from film studies and communication studies and journalism and um, uh, computer science and um, to to talk about what is happening in the world of of journalism, of media production, you know, across platforms, documentary filmmaking, podcasting in this changing digital age, um, you know, changing as you and I speak. But, you know, by the time this airs in a few days, um, you know, uh, who well, knows from the other... will be gone, so so there goes the the swimsuit, <laughs> and then also the you know, Baltimore Sun is is new. I mean, and all these different. Just in the past week, 
things have yes. been over and then something was lumped into GQ. I, I, um, Pitchfork was lumped into GQ. Sports Illustrated laid everybody off. The LA Times did a strike on a stage to walk out on Friday because their right. big layoffs coming there. So yeah. when you start, first started writing for places like, you know, Miami Herald and things like that, I mean, you, it's a few years now. What have you seen as the good and the bad in the sea change of modern journalism? Right. I mean, the good is that there has been an uprising of the voices that we have not heard enough of, you know, primarily people of color, um, LGBTQ communities, women, um, that, you know, were not given the ink, <laughs> the inches in places that I worked at, even including the Village Voice, which, you know, was supposed to be the epitome of progressive publishing and, you know, had a lot of the same issues as the Miami Herald did, you know, sometimes more even. Um, so, you know, that's that's the good point of view. And, and you know, the internet has allowed has amplified those voices, those voices, you know, black Twitter, you know, RIP black Twitter, RIP Twitter. Um, but, you know, the, the, the uprising of, you know, voices, not from official channels has been uh, amazing. Um, the decline of places like the Miami Herald, which is just a shadow of what it was when I was there just 15 years ago, um, literally, you know, such a barely exists in print and still like, you know, tremendous, important, great journalism being done by you know, people there, not to disparage those who are there, uh, but they have one writer for arts coverage. Wait, wait, wait. I mean, what, when you say art, like music, film, television, theater, uh, yeah. sculpture, you know, Totally. everything all of, all of this all wow yeah wow yeah yeah so and i mean you know a, a city that has an amazing arts community and deserves rich and diverse coverage so yeah so i and, and can i ask uh, you then why do your you have a whole thing you're starting this new initiative you have students that you're teaching to be journalists. What are they expecting to do? They want to write. They want to be journalists. Where the hell do they expect to get jobs? And what are they hoping to learn? Yeah, no, these are very good questions. I, I mean, and, and we, too. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we, and we actually have a growing journalism department. Like students are very, very interested in it. Um, you know, and they do, of course, they they're interested in podcasting, right? There are growth fields, right? And, you know, I think they're also interested in just learning how their own social media posts can um, be good journalism, because that is where journalism is taking place and how they can be a, a critical me media consumers as well as critical media producers, even if it's not necessarily um, how they're making their money or if it's within a commercial environment and they are making their money um but but how those things can still matter but um yeah I'm just, i mean i'm just I, all, all i can think of in my head right now is if if the time somehow intersected and back in in like 1939 you get a hitler invades czechoslovakia but then it has like 20 more characters and then it has to stop you know <laughs> We'll, we'll figure it out in 1945. See next tweet. I mean, you know, we, we laugh in order not to cry because is our world that far from that right now? I mean, you know, there's a lot of very critical election coming up this year and um, there's war and there's environmental collapse. And, um, and so I kind of, you know, I, I like the idea of, you know, we're, everybody should think about how to be critical media consumers and producers because we all are right um now whether we're all gonna figure out how to make an income doing that whether all of my students are or not and you know a lot of them do go on to become lawyers or um other things uh or at a certain point they'll figure out a way to have a, a, a self-driving tesla where you can be the Uber Tesla driver and write while you're driving so that they, they, they make the income and they can write their books and, and their articles, which is an important. Yeah. Yeah, can, do, do you believe though that writing or journalism or both can still 
change the world? Or is it just, it's great to read, it makes you think, and then there's the world. Right. Um, I still believe in the power of art to change people's thinkings and points of, to make people see the world in new ways and then act accordingly. Um, and I think, you know, I think that we see that in writers like ta Coates, right? Or Isabel Wil Wilkerson. Um, absolutely. I, I think that these people are creating world change in the last few, Claudia Rankine doing, doing poetry. Um, I do. Um, what role newspapers, I mean, because even just the word newspapers, right, is now news media, <laughs> right, yeah. right, what is paper? I mean, I, you know, I do still, I don't, actually, do I still subscribe to any, I mean, subscribe to things online, subscribe to many things online. Um, which is, you know, like, people are reading, people are, are reading, they're just reading online. Um, well, yeah, well, true. And, and longer thing, not just tweets or Facebook posts or even, you know, 500 word essays, but they, they'll Kindle everything. They'll, a book will still be, a, a lot of people, by the way, we can read your book on Amazon, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's an audio book. Yeah. Ooh, who, yeah. Read, you read the audio, who reads the audio book? Oh gosh, I can't think of her name right now uh, because my brain's not working. But it's actually a pretty well-known audiobook reader. Uh, yeah, um, uh, but I am spacing on her name right now. Oh, they, yeah, I wanted I, to do it. I'm just guiding I, people to either buy the book, the hard yeah. copy book, uh, on Amazon or wherever books are sold. It's called The World According to Joan Didion from HarperCollins Books. It's written by our guest, Evelyn McDonald. We just have a, a couple of minutes left, if you don't mind. About, uh, yeah, no, no problem. I, I have my coffee. I can keep going. Oh, this is going and, and show the book again. Just you know, hold it up. Oh, oh, up. Here it is. Let's sell, yeah. let's sell some copies there. There we go. There we go. There's my name. There's some, oh, and by the way, it's a really beautifully, as, as you know, yes, you can buy the ebook or the audio book, but you will miss out on this beautifully designed cover. And particularly my favorite, the end papers, um, which, so you have to get this. This is a collage of illustrations by a wonderful illustrator named Ann Munches. And they're taken from um, the, the start of each chapter, has a little drawing, gold. And then we also have, here's a picture of Joan Didion as a child. Um, so it's really, the, you know, Harper one did a, a tremendous job of designing and printing this book. I'm gonna find another drawing. There's, there's the tablet um, notebook drawing. So it's a beautifully, published book an object that you want to hold but you can also buy the ebook as long as you spend some money because you know, it's journalism 2024 you know we're not all working for free let me let me i want to tell you what the most surprising thing about john didion was for me but not that i knew about I read one of her books and then saw your magical thinking on broadway and stuff but but um the thing that i didn't know and then i would love for you to tell us what your biggest surprise unexpected thing was about her. But I just didn't know about the Hollywood stuff. I didn't know that she was a a, a script doctor for want of a better term. That, right. Why don't you tell us about that? Right. So she was she and her husband John Gregory Dunn worked together um on screenplays, both doctoring other people's screenplays, but also writing their own. Um yeah. So they, they wrote the screenplay for Panic in Needle Park, starring Al Pacino, which I think is actually their best. Um, and for uh, the film adaptation of her book, Play It As It Lays, they wrote the screenplay for um, A Star Is Born, the Chris Christopherson, Barbara Streisand version. There's many fingers in that pie, but they were um, credited with the screenplay. Um, uh, Up Close and Personal. So that was sort of, um, that was how they made their money, <laughs> right? Uh, and, you know, and they loved doing it, but um they didn't necessarily have the same um uh sense of quality control because they understood that writers were just cogs in the machine and in, in hollywood um the thing that, that uh, you brought up and that i found most fascinating was one of her goals in rewriting or working on scripts was to make the female characters more real more you mm -hmm. know less stereotypical more likable more human is that is that true 
Yeah, she did. She definitely pushed back against stereotypes in um, Hollywood, in the film industry. Um, uh, her husband, John Gary Dunn, wrote a great book about their process of making up close and personal. Um, and he, you know, talks about, you know, how she would push back against um, negative stereotypes. Um of women are, are just cliches really. And, you know, some of it is just like, it's a cliche. Let's, let's not like further that. And the ability cliche. to change, you know, a script that had been two or three male writers and to look right. at, you know what, I'm going to fix this. She doesn't look like a blonde bimbo ditz. Okay. Right. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that was, uh, that, that was, you know, their bread and butter for, for many years. Now, let me I, ask you, what was the most surprising thing that you, discovering about in this process of writing the book. Right, right. Well, I think one of the things was unearthing um, articles that haven't been anthologized um, or speeches that she gave that um, I, you know, found in digging through archives and that I, I feel like revealed different side of Joan that we don't always see um, for essay, for instance, for um, the Saturday Evening Post in I think 60, Eight it was in, in definitely in the 1960s um she wrote a piece about um why she hated cops um uh, essentially about you know state violence against uh young and brown bodies um that never happens anymore yeah so. you know but people you know there's a she and she you know she was she was raised a you know a conservative goldwater californian republican um and some people felt like that was what she was her whole life, and it, it it was not. She was far more complicated than that, and and really, um, in some ways changed her point of view, but in some ways always had a real resistance to authority. Um, that that was evident, and you know, and of course that that strain of her questioning of um, the criminal justice system. Um, led to her seminal article on the Central Park um, Five case uh, decades before those those youth were exonerated. Um, so and you know and and, um, and also and and seeing that sense in which she did question her own preconceived notions and change them, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, that that sense of growth. Um, because she was a very assured and sometimes um condescending writer. She could be, right? She could be very imperious in her prose. Um, but she also was very much about admitting her mistakes and um vulnerabilities. And you know, I, I tell people to read her book where I was from, which the title itself tells you, you know, her, how she has changed. It's not where I am from, it's where I I was from. Yeah. And it's, it's her talking about how she was raised in this California myth um, of the frontier. And, you know, she's a fifth generation California daughter of, you know, gold, uh, gold rush explorers and pioneers. Um, and she was taught to really value that. And she did. And how she realized that, um, uh, you know, a lot of that is just, um, you know, now we would call it imperialist, you know, settler colonialism, right? Um, and that she really had a disillusionment with that, with her own, what her own mother, what her own parents taught her. Um, and that's part of, you know, and then she ended up leaving California and spending the last decades of her life in New York, which, so, she, which was no better. And she also eviscerates in, in sentimental journeys, but... Because a writer's always you know, find the things to a bit. That's just, this is what we do. So, right. um, I want to, before I get to our final, final question with Evelyn McDonald, uh, let's plug it one more time. The book, The World According to Joan Didion, which is available wherever books are books and, and things like that. Plus, let's not forget your other books. It was Queens. It was... Um, cause Queens we, of Noise. Queens of Noise about riot girls and that whole era and thing. Plus, Mama Rama, a memoir of sex, kids, and rock and roll. Let me ask you, that, and, and I do not ask you this because you are a female, and females get asked this about, well, gee, okay, you're a wife, and a mom, and an academic, and a professional writer. 
writing not just journalism but novel. Where, how do you balance? How do you juggle? I would ask that of anybody. This is not sort of a pre-feminist question. How do you carve up your day? Right. Um, well, I will say that uh, my son, who you might have met, no, you probably didn't meet. He wasn't around when we were in the institute together, but um, my son is now in college. Uh, so I do have empty nest and it is much easier now to have time to write and, and, and do those things. Um, uh, you know, when I was I raised three kids, I have to have two stepdaughters. Um, you know, you have to just, um, try to make sure you set aside the times of the day. And I, I find this balancing teaching and writing too. Now that's the big task for me is to not let my work at the university. I mean, part of my work at the university is to write. They expect me to write. I should write. That's part of what we do. But realistically, when, you know, when classes are on, um, it's, it's very all consuming. So I try to like have a day um, really that I set aside for writing. That works better for me than well, part of every day. So like one, one day, or two days a week. And so, how do you? What is your? What do you do for writing? How much do you put aside? Um, I try to when I'm when the school year is on when I'm teaching. I try to just have one day that's devoted, like and you know, generally, hopefully, it's Fridays, because um, it's that works well to like. Okay, I don't have anything else I have to do, but usually there's like stuff from the week that I have to finish, and it doesn't happen uh, when I'm not in classes, then, I, then I have a more like, um, when I, I have a, like, I have to write a certain, usually I have a certain number of word count a day, oh, like writing the word count, count thing, not the time thing. Interesting. I do more the word count thing. And, you know, it's 1000 words is generally the goal for this book. Um, I was written in a very condensed period. So I was trying for sometimes 2000. Um, yeah, which was a lot. Um, so, yeah. And and it's not fair to ask this, so don't answer if you don't want to, but what are you working on now? Because writers <laughs> and, and, and songwriters, they, 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 they don't want to answer. Is it still, are you working on something that you can write? I have, I have a few book ideas um, that are all, I'm working on all of them, I think, or I'm working on a couple of them. I'm I uh, probably not about music. I do like to have stepped outside of the world of music. Um, you know, as I said, it's, you know, something I've always loved, but um, I've also always had, always had other interests. And at this point I have all the music books and I, you know, happy to look at some other things. Um, so yeah, probably won't be music, but I also am just starting directing this new institute. So I'm a little focused on that. And we just started classes. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little, I'm sort of in a, uh, you know, sorting it out. I'm wearing my sorting hat. I don't know which house I'm going to end up in to do a Harry Potter. It's the only um, book I've read in the last 20 years besides the Torah. So it's amazing that I knew where that came from. When <laughs> and we are just delighted that you were able at least to take the time to talk with us, and especially the beginning of the semester and everything like that. But what a joy talking with Evelyn McDonald, the author of three books, including the most recent one, The World According to Joan Didion. When you finish this other thing that you're working that isn't music, but whatever the hell it is, please come back, talk to us, do some more. We would love to have you back and just much more success in life and good things and writing to you. Thank you so much, Rabbi, for having me. And happy birthday. If uh, your listeners don't know, it's a special week for you. So well, no, I, I should say not for me, for Dave. For Dave. Who okay, for Dave. Sorry. Sorry. He's the one who met you first because you went to the, the NEA. Right. Fellowship Sorry. And the thing. You know, me, we've never met, but it's a pleasure right. to meet you. Dave, yes. he returns his happy birthday. Thank you, Evelyn. Oh, I'm still on camera. Thank you. <laughs> happy birthday, Dave. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Shalom to you. Thank you. Bye.